All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Can y'all hear me okay? I think that's on. Okay. Great. Did everybody just sleep well, or were you just, like, thinking about the future things and <laughs> mindful, heartful, and maybe confused, maybe coming in this morning with more questions than answers? That's okay. Um, talked to somebody yesterday who was saying... Uh, I just just came away with so many more questions um, than answers after last night. And that was kind of by design, you know, so that today, um, as we get into it a little bit more deeply, hopefully those questions can be answered. So, um, yeah, just appreciated um, everybody's uh, questions and interaction last night and uh, definitely want to keep that going. So as you have questions, uh, be sure and ask those because... As they say, you know, if you have that question, probably somebody else also is having that. And by you asking that, um, not only are you getting, hopefully getting an answer, but um, you're serving other, other people who are probably wondering the same thing. So that's great. Um, good. So we'll, we'll jump into it. Let me open us in prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the cooler weather. That is a nice treat this morning to wake up to. And it's an expression of your kindness to us, and we're so grateful for that. Pray that you'd use our um, hours together this morning to um, help us to look to you, to see more clearly what you teach in your word, to contemplate our own um, existence and destination as people, and just where, where we're headed, what happens to us when we die, and just all of these kinds of questions, um, Lord, that you bring assurance and comfort to our hearts. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So um, what we'll do today is uh, we'll spend the next 45, 50 minutes unpacking a little bit um, of a case for amillennialism. Um, and then Pastor Billy's going to share some pastoral thoughts about it and talk about kind of his own personal journey there and, and what he's learned as a pastor when it comes to this subject. And then, uh, and then uh, following that, we'll use the remaining um, hour or so to just go through questions. Now, Eric, somebody asked yesterday if they can submit questions through the live stream. Um, and if, if you would see that, would they put that in the chat section maybe? And, uh, and then you can flag me down and, and we can read that question and answer it that way. So those that are listening by live stream, you can do it that way. Um, if you have Eric's personal number, you're welcome to text it directly to him as well, right? Um, okay. But if not, you can send your questions in through the chat, and we'll try to field those here. Okay, so let's, let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 20. And uh, yeah. So I'll put the amillennial graphic behind me just so that that's up there. Um, so remember, um, amillennialism, as we mentioned yesterday, is not necessarily the view that there's no millennium, but that the millennium is uh, figurative. It's a period of time. It's an age, uh, namely the church age, the, the, the periods between... Um, the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. So the, the period between the first and second coming, um, an amillennialist would view as the, the figurative millennial reign of Christ. Um, so, of course, you know, when we talk about millennium, whatever view we're talking about, uh, that idea emerges from Revelation 20, and it says... Uh, we'll just read through that again. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their 
foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is the, and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. And their numbers like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay. So question would be, how does an amillennialist, an amillennialist interpret some of these images? Um, mentioned yesterday the binding of Satan as something that seems to be uh, what Jesus referred to in, when he talked about must, a, must a, uh, a, a strong man has to be bound before you can go and, and plunder his house. He uses that analogy. Um, so that it seems that the binding of Satan is something that occurred during earth, Jesus' earthly ministry, meaning he is now bound. Um, now, we mentioned last night, in what sense is he bound? He, his, we might say his influence is greatly reduced, at least in terms of the spread of the gospel. So, we, we see, you know, when we go to Nepal, we see the power of Satan as very alive and active in people. So, we're not, by, by Satan being bound doesn't mean that that's not true, but at the same time, we see the church growing and flourishing in that exact context, which, anecdotally speaking, is proof that Satan is bound in terms of the spread of the gospel, in terms of his ability to deceive the nations in a way that, that would effectively prevent, prevent them from coming, coming to Christ. So we know that Christ can overcome demonic opposition. That's what he does when he saves anybody. He overcomes human sinfulness and hardness of heart. Um, how is Jesus able to come and, and win hearts and change lives and save people if Satan still has a fair degree of power and he's not going to be bound until future? So, however, if he's bound at Jesus' earthly ministry, then the gospel can go forth in, in unrestricted power. Again, which is not to minimize Satan's influence, but it means ultimately Jesus has the power over him and everything that he's doing. And so that's reflected in this idea that, that Satan is, in some sense, in the church age, in the present evil age, in some sense is bound. Um, coming to verse 4, um, describes believers... We believe that that describes believers who have died and are already reigning with Christ in heaven during this current millennial age. Um, and it doesn't require uh, it to be interpreted as an, a literal reign on earth during a literal millennium. I saw the thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority had, to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. So these are, these are souls in heaven standing before God um, in his presence, deceased believers in heaven with God in his presence, um, reigning with Christ during this millennial age. In other words, the present age that we're in, we believe, as Jesus said, to be, um, I'm sorry, not Jesus, but, I, you know, there's a scripture to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, and Jesus told the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. So death in the present evil age translates us into heaven to be with God in, in, with God in his presence. Um, it's not the idea that we, we, we uh, go, to, go to sleep and, and, and are in an intermediate, unconscious state until the end, and then we go to heaven. Um, that would be one view. But no, we believe that when a Christian dies, he's immediately translated into heaven to be with God. Um, and, and so believers are, are with God during this period here 
at the second coming, though, something happens. So it says here, all rise, all are judged. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that, those scriptures in just a second. But the idea of this sort of second, second event is um, that at the second coming, all believers, whether those that are alive or every believer that has died throughout history, at the second coming of Christ is when we get a glorified body. So that this, this new physical idea is introduced um, at the second coming, whereas prior to the second coming, believers wouldn't have glorified bodies, and the, the earth is not yet renewed, the heavens are not yet renewed. But at the, so everything is, is, is uh, spiritual. Believers are in heaven with God in his presence spiritually, but at the second coming, a physical dimension is introduced. So it talks about... Um, the, the new heavens and the new earth and, and this, this renewal of creation that's going to eventually take place. In other words, at the second coming of Christ, a physical dimension is introduced. Um, heaven and earth pass away. The new heavens and new earth come down. Um, so I believe at, at that time, I mean, we will have glorified bodies that will be similar to Jesus' resurrection body. Because the New Testament teaches that Jesus' resurrected body is the first fruits. It's, it's a picture of what's going to happen to all believers when we get new bodies. So it's not, you know, after the second coming, it's not that we're just um, spirits floating around in a spiritual realm. But after the second coming, we're given a physical, tangible body, and we're placed in a physical, tangible realm called the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state. Um, a renewed creation. It will be recognizable, it seems, by the way John describes it in Revelation, that it, it will be recognizable, but it will be enhanced in, in a tremendous degree of enhancement. You know, I think that everything that, about nature and creation that our hearts are attracted to now are just shadows of what's ultimately to come. That it's going to be, it's going to be that, but a hundred times better. Um, so you know that kind of dispels the idea that when Christians die, we just are you know floating on clouds, playing harps, and angels are f flying around, or like this picture of just this ethereal existence in some nebulous nothingness. Um, no, there's there's a physical dimension to all of this, and you know in the Chronicles of Narnia at the very end. Um, they go into, you know, Lewis portrays this as, um, as they go into this new realm and it's recognizable. They're like, this, this reminds us of, um, you know, wherever they're from, somewhere in England, right? It, rem it reminds us of, of that, but it's, it's different. And so at first, they think that this was created... Um, to be a reflection of this. But they, at the very end, they come to this conclusion that actually this was created to lead to ultimately this. Like this is ultimate reality, and this was just the shadows of what's coming. And that the, everything we loved about uh, you know, life in the, in the town and in our house and in our community was just, was just an appetizer for the real thing. This is the real existence. This is true reality. This is reality as God sees it. This is the destination of history. We thought this whole journey was to get us back to here. You know, they realized, but actually. So anyway, I think that, that's like the very last of the last book, I believe. So um, you might go back and see it. It's a beautiful way to portray it. Um, so just to underscore that when we talk about final state, new heavens and new earth, I mean, we're talking about physical stuff, you know, and uh, will there be beautiful mountains and trees and rivers and probably, I mean, we're not exactly sure what that's going to look like, but everything, all of the effects of the fall will be reversed and, and redeemed and, you know, there's this, this picture throughout Revelation of, of Eden being restored and not just brought back, but actually enhanced, it's, it's Eden redeemed and advanced forward. Um, because when you think of Eden, in the original Garden of Eden, 
God's presence is there. There's perfect fellowship and unity. There's the beauty of all of creation. There's man's authority over all of creation. And it's this, this place of, of wonder and perfection and bliss in God's presence. So how can heaven be better than that? Well, heaven can be better than that when there's this new category of grace and mercy that's introduced. So prior to the fall, there's not the experience of wrath averted, mercy granted, grace given, sins forgiven. There's not that before the fall. But after the fall, in the new Eden, the renewed and restored Eden, and, and it's better in the sense that this existence is one now having received a grace that we did not deserve. And at that foundation, um, you know, we will have experienced creation and creation groaning, all the effects of the fall in our lifetime and everything. But now we see it, it like our own hearts, being restored and renewed and redeemed and rescued and, and true flourishing. True, it's the, the idea throughout the whole Bible of the idea of shalom and the, the peace and prosperity and f- flourishing that God intends for his people will be fully and finally realized in the new heavens and the new earth. And it's the Christian's hope. It's what we look forward to. It's what we long for. Um, so that, that, that is the, the, the way amillennialists um, would see that time as that is this. There's, there's not an in-between time of, of a millennial reign of, of Jesus bodily on the earth, reigning, the, the, the Christians have an authority, unbelievers um, still existing but submitting unwillingly to Christ and, um, and sort of this intermediate period of time. We Rather, we would see the millennium as uh, the present age culminating with the second coming of Christ and the immediate introduction into the final state, the new heavens and the new earth. Um, all of this emerges from our, our theological uh, v- reading, a, the- a, a biblical theology of reading the Bible. In other words, how do we read the Bible in terms of its grand storyline from Genesis to Revelation? And some patterns that we see are, are promise and fulfillment. So promise, fulfillment. It's all, but every, with every promise and every fulfillment, the storyline of redemption is advancing. It's not just going in circles. It's actually advancing. And more of God's intended um, pr- redemptive purpose is coming into clarity over time throughout the course of, um, of biblical history. So there's that. There's, a, there's also, we mentioned last night, the already not yet of the kingdom. Um, in other words, we recognize that from day one, it's God's intention to bring all things to subjection under Christ. And that he's moving history towards that end. And in, and in one sense, at the coming of Christ and his death and resurrection and ascension, um, is Jesus seated on the throne? Let me ask you that. Today, is Jesus seated on the throne reigning from heaven? Okay, good. Yeah. Yes. At the same time, um, does evil persist in the world? And does it seem to be getting worse? Yes, no doubt about that. So is, you know, is Jesus reigning and has the kingdom come to earth? We answer that by saying, yes, it has already, but there's still a lot of not yet about it because evil still persists. And all things are not in subjection to Christ yet. They will be but they're not yet. So that's the, that's the already not yet. We talked about inaugurated uh, eschatology and consummated eschatology, meaning that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. It's been set up. Jesus is reigning on the throne today, right now. Uh, he's not going to take his throne later in a millennium. He's reigning now. And if he's reigning now, um, you know, that, that just fits with the idea that this is a millennial age where he currently reigns. And we recognize that there's, there's a lot of not yetness associated with that as well. So here's where we would differ. Let me just draw that again. We had this up here last week. Um, so this is the Old Testament time. Um, Jesus, let's say, comes down. This is cross, resurrection. Um, this begins the 
um, kingdom of God is inaugurated. So uh, we will say first coming. Over here, we'll call this second coming. Um, so some of this kingdom is already. Some of it is not yet. This period of time is also the present evil age. The present evil age has a defining end point. This is where it, it ends. It ends at the, the present evil age ends at the second coming. It doesn't end and then kind of persist under the surface for a thousand years and then ends. The, the, the Bible, in our view, doesn't seem to portray sort of those two, two endings of the present evil age. It seems to talk about the evil age goes on and on, and then boom, it is over. Um, so the present evil age has a defined ending point, but the kingdom, you know, does not have a defined ending point. Maybe we'll draw it like that. <laughs> no dotted line here. Something changes when, when Jesus comes back, um, but the present kingdom persists into eternity future, even though it has been inaugurated, it started uh, with the coming of Christ. So here's where we would differ from postmillennialism. When we think about um, God is moving history to bring all things um, in subjection to Christ, that's where, that's where he's moving this. And so that means that um, the, the church, in, in terms of, you know, if we had a, that morality scale right here, so to speak, um, the, the world is getting worse, but the church is flourishing and getting stronger, and this kingdom of God is advancing, and uh, the gospel is going forth to all nations at the same time that the, the world is becoming a worse place. So this is where we would differ from post-millennialism, which would, which would very much agree with, us that, with this line, that the, the world is... The church is growing and it is flourishing and it is expanding and the gospel is going forth to all nations and revivals happening in various parts of the world. But they would extend things being in subjection to Christ, they would extend that to political advancement, to global advancement, to um, that, that being, all things being um, under Christ's authority is going to be realized in political advancement. And I don't mean like just politics, but I mean positions of authority and influence in the world um, where, where we would realize and, and say, no, the, what, what all things being in subjection to Christ is the advancement of the church and that it would be great if uh, we could all have a, a country that is favorable to Christianity. But it doesn't seem that that's the mission of the church is to establish a, a country, a, a geopolitical entity that is uh, driven by Christian values and ideas. It seems that what the Bible, when the Bible talks about the future, it, it treats it in terms of actually it's going to be the opposite. Like you should expect trials and tribulation and sufferings and persecutions. They're going to come. The world's going to hate you. Evil authorities are going to seek to rule over you. And yet in the midst of all of that, the gospel is going to advance. The church is going to grow. Um, so it's a bit idealistic, I think, to um, expect subjection to Christ to include um, political Christianization of the world. Um, but rather, we should expect to see the opposite of that and the church growing. So, um, you know, the amillennial view is, is really a simple and direct eschatology. Um, first coming, millennial age, second coming, final state, new heavens and new earth. Now, um, I'm going to go through just a series of questions that I think people might have in terms of the Amil view. Um, but before I do, just want to open it up. Um, any questions from anybody up to this point on amillennialism? Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, this, we're going to have this mic here. Right here, Ms. Ms. Uh, Slauson. Okay, um, what I'm understanding is from the uh, first coming of Christ to 
the second coming of Christ is the millennium. Right. But where does tribulation come in during that point? Because it says Satan is loosed, but yet he's supposed to be bound to some point during the millennium. Yeah, yeah, great question. So what about the tribulation um, in an amillennial view? Right. So at some point in history, in, in the world that we're living in, um, it does seem that Satan will be given more slack. Will be, slack will be let out of the line and he will be loosed and there will be a period of intensification of tribulation for the church that um, it will be more pervasive, it will be more intense, more Christians will be killed, persecuted, that as history is beginning to close, um, God will somehow, and it's not clear biblically how or when or if there's specific timing, but at some point Satan is released and allowed to bring greater persecution to the church. So under an amill view and a post-mill view, um, the tribulation is something that Christians experience. Does that mean that because of the separation, as one gets greater, the other one gets worse? Great point. Yep. So um, is that because of this degree of separation? Yeah. That a as it gets worse, tribulation is going to get, tribulation is going to get more intense. And so um, at the, the loosening of Satan for a period at the end is, seems to be God's kind of, Sovereign allowing Satan to, to have one last effect to demonstrate his power so that God can very quickly and swiftly demonstrate his power over Satan. Sorry. Um, so that he can demonstrate that power over Satan. Yeah. So under the Amil view and the post mill view, Christians, we, you know, we do believe in the tribulation. We do believe Christians will go through the tribulation. Um, it's, it's really the dispensational pre-mill view that relegates the tribulation to a specific seven-year period, which I think comes from a literalistic reading of Daniel. Um, and literalistic is a, is a phrase I'm using to distinguish from literal, literalistic reading of Daniel, um, which leads them to conclude that the tribulation is a specific seven-year period, um, during which um, the, the elect number of Jews will be brought in and a number of Gentiles will, you know, uh, realize that they should have become Christians and they'll become Christians as well. And that, 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 that's the last period of bringing them in. Um, but the church is, in a dispensational pre meal view, the church is taken out of that period of tribulation. And it's, it's tribulation for Israel primarily and secondarily to allow any remaining Gentiles to change their mind and, and come in. Um, which fits under that broader dispensational theology that we talked about last night. So, great question. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> the, word, the, the scriptures that come to my mind um, for tribulation is when Jesus promises tribulation. Uh, right. And also, it says, all those who endure to the end will be saved. Um, I was Excellent. just now, that, those two verses came to my mind. Excellent. So let's look at that. Um, if you want to turn, please, to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 21. And actually, I mean, we could start at verse 15 because uh, this is where dispensational premillennialists get, get the idea, get a lot of their ideas um, You know, flee to the mountains, let the one who's on the housetop not go down to get what's in his house, let the one who's in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Alas for women who are pregnant, those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight might not be in winter or on Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. Um, so we're in verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be. And if those days had not been cut short... No human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Um, so there's a, a reference where Jesus is 
is referring to tribulation. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, sun will be darkened, the moon will give its light, stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes on the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with, of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. They will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, which, which we would interpret that as a reference to the second coming of Christ. Um, because the sec what, what we need to note about the second coming is that um, it's always loud and visible. There's not any sense in which Jesus returns suddenly and secretly and nobody knows about it and people just disappear off the face of the earth like uh, the blip, you know, I think... <laughs> Marvel's blip idea is, is similar to a dispensational pre rapture idea. Um, but we don't really see the Bible mentioning that. Every time, the son of, every time Jesus comes, it's big and loud and visible. Um, so there's a reference to Jesus' tribulation. And I'm going to come to, I think we have a question on the chat, so I'll get there in just a second. Um, but the, the tribulation do we want to go here right now, is, yeah, so anyway, you make a good point that the Bible always warns Christians, um, actually, okay, let's do this, go to John 17, I think that's an even better reference, so that, Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the seriousness and intensity of the tribulation, then you come to John 17, verse 15, I do not ask, Jesus' high priestly prayer, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. In the context there, look at verse 14, I've given them your word, the world has hated them. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. But I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, implication being, even as you leave them in it, like, they're going to be in it. They're going to go through persecution and tribulation. But Jesus is praying that they would be kept and preserved in the midst of such tribulation, not taken out of it. Um, so again, uh, I, you know, you could say a bit facetiously that Jesus actually prayed that the church would not be raptured. Um, but I, I don't ask that you take them out of the world. But then, he, but then you are going to take us out of the world? So how do, we, how do we square that? So, now that said, just to mention uh, rapture, I mean, you do realize, and it, depending on how we define it, I mean, all Christians believe in a rapture. The amillennialists, do we believe in a rapture? Absolutely. Rapture just means being taken up and transferred from one place to another place. Just believe that happens here. You know, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is true. Those who are alive will be caught up with those who have died, and they'll meet the Lord in the air, and they'll go to heaven with Jesus, and we'll be with him forever. I mean, absolutely, there's a rapture. It's just simultaneous with the second coming. Um, now, we have to be careful. If somebody just walks up to me on a Sunday and says, do you believe in the rapture? I'm probably going to ask a few questions, because most people, when they use that word, they're referring to a dispensational premillennial idea of a rapture, meaning, do you believe this, the church will be secretly rescued, followed by seven years of intense tribulation, followed by a second coming, followed by a millennium? And in that sense, no, we, don't, we would not believe in that. But many wonderful believers do. So, um, and people we love and respect that cherish God's word. It just doesn't seem to be uh, where we're at with that from our reading of scripture. Okay, Eric. All right, this is a question from Casey Miller. Is there a difference in now and when Satan is bound? Is he bound in the millennium or is he the same as he has been this whole time and given more free reign later? Yeah, I, I, if I understand the question correctly, I think the last statement would be how a millennialist would interpret that, that he is bound now, and so the gospel goes forth in power, and in the end, um, he will be given less restriction, more freedom, to wreak more havoc, to oppose God's people with greater intensity, just before the end comes, just before the second coming. Um, so, uh, which, is, which is to be contrasted against the, the pre-mill view, which the binding of Satan happens during the millennium. 
So rapture, seven-year tribulation, second coming of Christ. At that point, Satan is bound for a thousand years, at the end of which he's released. So that would be the difference. Yep. And another question from Delane Holloway. How, sounds like the A-mill and post-mill view have close foundations, but why does the gospel going out more and church growing over time not improve the society around us inherently? Yeah, good question. Um, so they do have uh, like foundations, no doubt. Um, and the church growing should lead to transformation of culture and society. Um, but we don't want to minimize the impact of sin and fallenness and demonic power. So it cautions us against an overly optimistic view of the extent to which that might happen. We pray that it would. We pray that our influence would change our cities and change our communities. We want that to happen. Um, and we work hard to make that happen. We want the, the redeemed people of God to be salt and light in the earth, no doubt. But what is the actual overall extent and impact that that will have globally, will it, a, a post mill would say that that eventually leads to the Christianization of the planet, into the golden age, into that, that w a world that is ultimately Christian. Um, whereas I think our, our view of, of eschatology, the destination of history, the worsening of evil, how it's all going to end up and everything, uh, what we believe about the millennium, Satan being bound, later being loose, it cautions us against that, uh, an overly optimistic view of, of the ultimate impact that we, we would have. But on, on smaller scales and in various locations across the planet, absolutely, and we do see this happening. I mean, I remember about reading about um, when revival came to Argentina in the 70s, um, and, you know, uh, crime went down, prostitution went down, bars were closing left and right, um, agriculture just suddenly began to flourish, and, you know, people's vegetables were like twice as big as what it used to be. And I mean, there was like this transformation of society as God was bringing revival to the church. Um, so I do think we see that. I just think that those are seeds of things to come. Those are, God has given a foretaste of the new heavens and new earth on a microcosm. Um, but that that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily, a post mill would look at that and say, okay, that happened here. Check, let's make sure that happens in every other s sector of the, the planet because ultimately that's what God is doing and that's where he's going to get it into the, that's how he gets it to the golden age. Um, but like any period of revival, God moves in great ways and then there's decline shortly after that. It's rarely sustained over multiple generations, rarely. And so, you know, I would say that's a realistic eschatology um, set against an optim overly optimistic eschatology. So we want to have faith, we want to have hope, we want to work to see these things happen. But understand that um, God's goal for the church is not to um, bring heaven to earth in the fullest sense. You know, what about this whole thing that the world is not our home? That God, is, God has a destination for us that is like earth, but it's a new heavens and a new earth. That it's not ultimately, um, we're not ultimately to find our rest and hope and shalom here in the here and now. So a, a post mill would, would be, um, it, it's a critique to say it that way, but um, would be looking for that in the here and now and the restoration of, of culture and society in the here and now. Um, so is that good? Okay, good. Did somebody have a, another question? Um, okay, going back to the idea of, of tribulation and rapture, if you want to turn to um, Revelation 3.10. So I preached this passage recently um, to the church in Philadelphia. And it says, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So... Um, a dispensational premillennialist would look at that text as really a proof text for the rapture prior to a pre-trib rapture. Um, so that's actually that one. So we see that as a proof text for a pre-trib rapture. 
Um, I will keep you from the hour of trial. I, you, I will rapture you out of here from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world, the great tribulation. Um, but I argued in that sermon on, on this verse that this is actually not a promise to rescue us out of trial, but to preserve us through trial. And so if you look at that, why, why would we think that this is, not the, this is not a promise to be exempt from the tribulation, but to be preserved through the tribulation? Where, how, how so? Well, because we're told here that, we're told in verse 11, hold fast what you have. So we're told to hold fast what we have, which it wouldn't be necessary to hold fast to anything if we're rescued out of tribulation. We already, we already have what we need. It's not like we can't hold fast. We're, we're in heaven. Um, and it goes on to say, uh, so that no one may seize your crown. Um, so we're told to hold fast what we have, that our crowns would not be seized by our persecutors. Right? Who would seize your crown? The persecutors. But if you're, if you're taken out of tribulation, then there's no possibility for our crown to be seized because we're already in heaven. We've received our crown. We're not going to lose anything. So it's not a possibility if we're not here for the tribulation. We will conquer and overcome. You know, that, that's the next phrase. What's there to conquer if we're in heaven during that tribulation and we're exempt from it? So I think that passage could even be argued um, to, that, that this is an argument for why we will be on the earth during the hour of trial. So the keep is not protection and isolation from. The keeping that is promised to us is a keeping in the sense of, I will preserve you through this tribulation. It's keeping in that sense as opposed to keeping in the sense of being rescued out of it so that you don't have to go through it at all. Um, so I think that's an important point. Um, so the, amillennialism um, raises a few other questions. So uh, again, feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions if you have any. Anything up to this point? Yes, ma'am. In Matthew 24, it says that there's two women that will be in a field, and one will be taken and the other one will be left. Now, is that in your understanding in the amillennial, is that going to be after the tribulation when the Jesus comes a second time? Great question, yep. So a couple of ways people have viewed that. So a dispensational premillennialist views that as, as a proof text for the rapture. So people are going about their life and somebody is, is taken. They, they disappear, they go straight to heaven, poof, blip, you know, that just, they're gone. Um, that that would be a, a proof text for the rapture, that it's a, a referring to the rapture. But I think a better reading of that passage in its context, the whole context is persecution and judgment that is coming upon the earth. Um, the, Jesus is making an analogy, so we want to avoid an, a, a literalistic interpretation of that. Um, as though this applies to women in the field, not men in the home, women in, the, you know, like we, we can't get, that, that would be literalistic, but to recognize, no, Jesus is just making an analogy to make a, a deeper point. The point being that judgment will come swiftly and suddenly, and um, the, the taken, taken away is not a positive thing in that passage. They are taken away to judgment. They're not taken away to heaven. They're taken away to judgment. And, um, and so we can't make too much of um, one is taken, the other is left. So, of course, the Left Behind series is built on that idea, is that some are taken to heaven, others are left behind. But um, I believe that passage in its broader context of swift judgment that's coming upon the earth, that you better repent or you're going to be taken away to judgment. Um, it helps us understand that that's not a reference to uh, those taken to heaven and others left on the earth. It's actually a taking away to judgment. Now, to your question, okay, so when does that happen? Well, in, our, in an Amil view, that happens... Um, where am I at? Uh, 
Oh, that, that's why I'm like, that's not on mill. <laughs> um, in an on-mill view, that happens at the, at the second coming. Mm. Judgment comes suddenly, judgment comes swiftly, judgment comes unexpectedly, and, and in the same sense, believers are, you know, rise and meet the Lord in the air, and immediately are translated into the final state, the new heavens and the new earth. So that, that is all one event in an on-mill view. Um, taken away to judgment, rising, being judged, um, given glorified bodies, uh, the, the earth and the cosmos being um, destroyed and rebuilt um, as a new heavens and a new earth. All of that um, is what happens at the second coming, which is why the second coming is always loud and glorious and boisterous and known and not, uh, nobody's, you know, the, the, in the movies, uh, a plane went down because the pilot disappeared and um, we're not sure what happened. And, um, you know, there's just not, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the razor buzzing on the sink is like still a, gives me chills, you know. Um, it's, so, you know, it's, it's not, there's not, all of that, all of those images assume a secret rescuing initially, but the coming of Jesus is not, does not seem to be secret and mysterious and unknown and news articles trying to figure out what happened and maybe it was aliens and maybe it was, and there's all these ideas, the world just doesn't know what's going on. Um, no, Jesus comes on the clouds, every knee bows. And some bow willingly because their Savior's here to get them and others bow in, in humble recognition that I missed my chance and he really is the Savior and Redeemer of the world, and I'm getting what I finally have deserved and have wanted my whole life, which is judgment. Um, so the, the, the Philippians 2, every knee will bow, um, it's encouraging for believers. It's, it's a sober warning for unbelievers. Every knee will bow, some willingly, yeah. and some in humble recognition that they got it all wrong. Um, all of that happens at the second coming of Christ, which is a huge event. That's the ending of history. So, okay. Was there another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so it's not a question going back to Revelation chapter 3 when it says, um, keeping in mind that for, for me when I read the book of Revelation that this was written to um, the seven churches in a, in a time of great persecution and suffering. Um, and John is saying, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing um, that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one takes your crown. And I think that um, for me, when I read this, is like um, looking to Christ. Um, that is our hope. In the midst of it, enduring persecution and suffering, that's a reality. Um, and, and even we see it in China. We see it all over the world that our brothers and sisters are going through severe persecution and, and, and trouble and suffering. And I would have to ask the question, are they looking to Christ and his coming? Of course, that, that's the answer to that. That's the hope. Not, not a, an escape route. Right. You know, so when I read this, uh, I'm keeping in mind that John was writing to the seven churches who were under severe persecution for their faith in Christ, and, and that ought to be the, the pattern that we hold to, I yeah. think. That's great. And, I mean, as you're pointing out, it's really in the flow of New Testament teaching that that's what Christians are, are looking forward to. I mean, the, the New Testament just teaches us extensively about enduring suffering and persecution. And... Um, when we went through the book of Hebrews, we saw that. And now we're going through Revelation. We're seeing that. And um, the expectation is that there will be trials and tribulations. And it's going to get bad at periods of time. And um, that the Christian's hope is that in the midst of those things, they will cling to the word. Hold fast to what you have, it says. That they will cling to the word and find Jesus preserving them through all of that. That's our hope. Not that we would uh, be exempt from it suddenly. Um, so good, good question. Yes, uh, Dave. Um, so in Genesis, we have uh, the 
precedence, I guess, of we had the precedence of God um, delivering Lot from that judgment as well, and I just didn't know if that kind of puts it on the other side of the the tribulation for the millennial. But. In in uh, what sense? What's the what's your thought there? Well, the thought what's is the he delivers righteous people away from the judgment, mm. which would keep them, I guess, in here away from the tribulation. Yeah, good question. So we want to think about um, God rescuing Lot. Um, what is its function in the overall flow of redemptive history? So is the rescuing of Lot from the coming judgment meant to be, and I think this battery might be going out because it's starting to crackle. Um, double A's. Oh, did you? Okay. Okay. Um, is the rescuing of Lot from the coming judgment meant to be paradigmatic for the church as a whole in the culmination of history? Or is the rescuing of Lot meant to be a picture of the way God preserves his people from judgment despite their own sin and failure and walking away and accommodating to culture and all of the human weakness as God advances his redemptive plan? So I, I think it's more the second one and that... Um, the fact that God rescued Lot from coming judgment, it would be hard to make an argument, in my view, that that's a proof that we won't go through tribulation. Um, I think, rather, it's a picture that God, God will, God's people will not be judged for their sin when they are protected by the blood of Christ, when they're in the fold, when they're in the family of God, the people of God. Um, so it's more of a picture of protection from actual judgment than protection from opposition, persecution, and tribulation. Make sense? Great question. Good observation, too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, on the amillennial tribulation period, um, in church a couple weeks ago, when you were talking about, I think we were like in seven and eight, and it says one-third will be... Uh, saved and you know and it just kind of goes through that process is that what you're referring to i mean does that scripture kind of tie in right here on the tribulation where people will have a chance and have another chance before the second coming right right i think so and um and i don't again like in revelation I, we, we don't want to be too quick to interpret numbers as exact right you know definition numerical definitions and percentages like 33.3 repeating people will i don't think it's meant to be taken that way i mean i think it's more as pastor billy mentioned last night um broad and narrow uh, kind of stuff and that uh and that yeah as if if we're living in the millennial age and the end of that age is an increased period of tribulation um it's also an increased period of salvation and growth of the church just before the second coming so um all of that to say if i'm understanding your, your question and comment correctly yes i would agree and i think that that idea is reflective of what amillennialists have uh, have understood that passage as to mean so does that answer the question okay great thank you uh yes sir tom uh, brother dave mentioned a lot and i look at noah being similar to that and that God kept Noah and his family in the ark above the flood. And I think it's a type of the end time saint. The premillennials, as you probably know, see that as the Noah being taken up above the flood, that right. will be taken up above the flood of iniquity. But again, it's the bottom line is that the righteous are always spared. Yeah. Whether we gotta go through it or we don't go through it. As you keep saying, he's with us, and I think that's a thing we need to keep our eye on. That's good. Jesus is going to be with us. Amen. So that, that's a really good analogy um, from Noah and the flood, because just like with Abraham and Lot, we want to make a distinction between tribulation and judgment of sin. So we, Christians, God's people are preserved from judgment against our sin when we're hidden in, in Christ with God, with Christ in God, with God in Christ. Um, but we're never promised to be hidden and sheltered from tribulation. So both Lot and Noah is the picture of God's judgment. And, um, and it's a picture of God's people being preserved through judgment. Um, and if anything, and I've heard, I mean, I remember growing up hearing 
you know, the, the picture of Noah in the boat rising above the flood as being a picture of the church being rescued from the tribulation period. Um, but my response to that is Noah still endured a worldwide global flood. You know, it's not like he didn't have to go through the flood. He went through it 100%. He was just preserved from it, it being the picture of divine judgment against sin. So he's around it. He's in it. He's not rescued from it. He didn't get sent to the moon while God destroyed the earth and then get brought back or something. He went through that tribulation, but he was not judged. He, was, he didn't receive divine judgment in that. So re really, it, it's an argument against uh, being rescued from tribulation. So thanks for sharing that. Yes, Jim? Uh, so a comment first and a question, because I, I keep going back to this. and We keep circling back to it about tribulation and our idea of what it is. And you, I think you touched on this last night that our very westernized idea of tribulation um, doesn't that affect all of this, you know, because I think for most of us, I know myself growing up as a Christian, a believer, always thought that it was a, a time in the, in the future, you know, and obviously as a new Christian, I believed in the pre-trib, but um, thinking about the state of the world and yeah. what believers, and just looked, I'm, I've got this little quick article, I'm not reading the article, but it's it's actually, it was in Forbes magazine, but the figures come from Open Doors in January of this year. You know, they're, they're, it says across 76 countries, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, an increase of 20 million since last year. Mm. So, you know, what, won't that affect, I mean, every view, don't you think that affects every view? And then on that, I'm thinking, what do, believers in other countries and for us because this is maybe our most personal connection Barnabas you know mm -hmm. what do they teach and believe about this do you do you know yeah um, I don't think we've had an eschatological conversation with him um, so I can't I don't think I can speak to that but um, no I think it would be very difficult to come to somebody in a country where their family is being killed for being believers and to say you know, um, a, a period of intense tribulation is coming. But it gets more intense. How, I mean, how, how much worse can it get? We're being, yeah, we're being killed right now. I mean, even Paul said every day we're dying. Um, so this has been happening. This defines the church age, this intense persecution. Now, this idea of Satan being loose towards the end means that it's going to get more widespread. So that can account for the fact that in the United States, we're not having a gun put to our head for being a Christian. In other countries, they are, but it stands to reason that a period is coming where that type, what we see in other countries is going to become more widespread. And that would account for this idea of being uh, Satan, Satan being loosed. But yeah, I, I think it's just, it's, it's strangely convenient to say, um, we're living in a period where yes, the church is growing, um, but we're going to be rescued out of it, then I think a person in a persecuted church can say, well, then how do you explain what we're going through? Then, you know, the um, historic pre-millennials would, would come along and say, um, we're living in a period uh, where, yes, the church is growing, but it's about to get way worse. And that person's going, how can it get worse? You know, so some of the pre-mill views are a little bit harder. Moreover, the post-mill view is difficult to square with the persecuted church as well. I mean, if our church is growing, we're still being killed. In fact, the intensity of persecution is rising, not falling, and yet the church is growing. So how do we square your post-mill view with that, with our experience? Again, experience can't carry the day on it, but it, it's not an insignificant factor. So I, I think the amill position um, accommodates both what we read in scripture and what we experience in the world very well. Um, so, yes. Um, I could be um, not up to date on this, but isn't dispensationalism more of an American uh, phenomenon that uh, Europe and other countries don't hold to that? 
Well, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I would say Western, a Western phenomenon. So Western meaning Western culture, which would include Europe and, um, and the Western Hemisphere, um, in contrast to more Eastern culture, Eastern mindsets. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know the li the great theologians uh, coming out of Germany in the 18th century, and some of those were were writing about uh, dispensationalism, and but I but it's more of yeah I think that's probably right more of an American phenomenon at least popularized in American culture. Mm -hmm. um, having coming out of that teaching, and I won't say the church because we both know what it is. Um, now I've lost train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I know like Eastern Orthodox and all those guys, they don't have any, oh, uh, and I know what I was going to say is really like Jan mentioned last night, dispensationalism in the timeline of Christianity is a very short blip. They, this is a, a new teaching relative to what was going on uh, at 70 AD. Yep, yep. I mean, I agree, and uh, a lot of our millennialists make that point that um, what, while we don't find the term amillennial to be coined until Abraham Kuyper is usually who it's traced to, um, the, the Dutch um, statesman and theologian. Um, Dutch? Yeah. Anyway. And, uh, but, but, the, but the idea of a millennial age, that the thousand years refers to a millennial age, not a literal 1,000 years, no, no longer, no less, um, can be traced back to the early church fathers and most notably Augustine. So, um, amillennialism is typically associated with reform theology um, as a whole. So, so many reform theologians um, have embraced that idea over the centuries and taught it. And then later some of the other pre-mill dispensational ideas um, started to come in. And even, even, so even today you do have reform theologians who are not amillennial. Um, and you know, MacArthur, Grudem, uh, et cetera, many, many of them are. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's worth noting that the Amil position seems to be reflected throughout ch church history, um, m way more so than the pre-mill or the post-mill view. Yep. Good questions. Let's do one more, and then we're going to take a short break for Pastor Billy's section. Yes, Tom? I think Paul hit it pretty good in Acts 14. The caption says, Paul was stoned at Lystra. And then in verse 22, it says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that through much tribulation, you'll enter into the kingdom of, of God. Yeah. So we're going to go through tribulation. The distinction, I think, where many people differ is tribulation is the first church had and we're having versus what's called the great tribulation. And like Paul said, we're going we're to suffer. We're going to go through it if we're Christian. Right. Right. Yep. That's a, that's a good reference right there. Very good. Um, yeah, I think the only other thing I would want to add before we wrap up this session is I haven't mentioned much about what we believe about Israel because um, that is key and core to uh, dispensationalism in particular. Um, for ah mills and post mills, um, we believe that there, the New Testament teaches there is one new people of God, the true church, the new Israel, that all of the covenantal promises made to Abraham and found throughout the Old Testament are fulfilled in and through Christ and in the true church, which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles, um, that all those covenantal promises come here. So somebody asked me last night, how is dispensationalism different from covenant theology? So covenant theology would sort of be the opposite view of, of uh, the flow of redemptive history. Um, so we believe those covenants are fulfilled in and through Christ, through one new people made up of both Jew and Gentile. Um, so, th in other words, in contrast to dispensationalism, we would believe the way that anyone gets saved, including the Jew, is through faith in Christ alone. 
There's not a separate program of salvation for Israel and a separate program for the church that later eventually converge into one, but we are all saved in the same way by the same Christ. So I think that's the, the context of Romans 11. We don't have time to look at it, but where Paul talks about um, salvation go, is going out to the Gentiles, but all Israel will be saved. God's allowed a partial hardening for a period of time, but all Israel will be saved. So dispensational premills take that to mean that in the period of the great tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, God brings in all of the elect of Israel and, and brings history to where it's always been intended from the beginning. But we would understand that a little bit differently, where Paul's just creating a parallel to say, here's how God saves Gentiles, but that doesn't mean he's written off Israel entirely and moved on to non-Israel. Rather, the Jewish people will be saved in the exact same way as Gentiles are. Faith in Christ, repentance from dead works, not trusting in, in any Jewishness or sacrificial systems. They will be saved by putting their faith in Christ alone. And in the same way that there are elect Gentiles, there are elect Jews, and God is going to bring home all of his elect, which again is why amillennialism is associated with Reformed theology, which has um, the doctrines of grace and sovereignty of God and the doctrine of election as core to it. Um, because God established the church as his new covenant people. And that is where it has all been headed. That's the mystery of the ages coming to pass in the fullness of time. That the church is the, church is the new covenant people of God. It's the fulfillment of the covenant promises. The church is not merely programmatic for the ingathering of Israel at a future date set as a, as a template of how God's going to do it for Israel later or as, a, as an appetizer, as a teaser to make Israel want to come back. No, the church is not programmatic for that. The church is the destination of the people of God. He brings Jew and Gentile, creates one new man out of the two, breaks down the dividing wall of hostility. So as amillennialists, what do we believe about Israel? That they will be saved as well in the same way that Gentiles will be saved that the offer of salvation goes out. God gathers in his elect from the four corners of the earth, including Jew and Gentile, and uh, creates the true Israel, the new church, made up of both um, natural branches and grafted in branches, to use Paul's analogy. And that, uh, that's, that's the covenant promises coming to fruition in Christ in the true church. Okay, let's hit the pause button. Can we take just five minutes, bathroom, snacks, food, and then Pastor Billy will pick up with the next session.